With all the talk on the cable channels and in the blogosphere, you would think alien forces from another planet have conquered our nation's capital. It's like that scary movie from the 1950s, Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Some film scholars believe the movie is a paranoid parable warning of a communist takeover of America. But today, the body snatchers are, are you ready for this? Socialists. That's right. Socialists reportedly swarming over the city and making off with the means of production, namely the federal budget. I'm not making this up. Newsweek spotted the enemy a month ago, and it was us. Here's a headline on Salon.com. Newt Gingrich, reincarnated once again as himself, sounds as if Obama ate his contract with America for lunch and coughed it up as European socialism. I think it is the boldest effort to create a European socialist model we have seen. But the ghosts being conjured in the corridors of power aren't those great American radicals, Eugene V. Debs or Norman Thomas. No, Stalin, Marx, and Lenin have risen from the grave and are stalking our highest officials. Just listen to CNBC's Jim Cramer. We're in real trouble. We're in real trouble between what's happening in the world economy and our president, who seems to be taking his cues. Guess who he's taking his cues from? No, not now. Not Pancho Villa, although I had lunch with him. No, he's taking cues from Lenin. And I don't mean the all we need is love Lenin. I'm talking about that we'll take every dime Americans have Lenin. And others followed suit. Liberal Democrats, Obama and his minions and the drive-by media are speeding down the highway, implementing socialism as fast as they can. Some economists say the stimulus plan President Obama just put uh, to into law moves us closer to socialism. One small step towards fixing the economy or one giant leap towards socialism in the United States. That is socialism That's pure true. and simple. So what does a real live socialist think about all this? We consulted the Endangered Species Act and actually found one way out in the People's Republic of Southern California. That state's economy has tanked with one of the country's highest number of foreclosures and unemployment above 10% and climbing. California is a financial earthquake off the Richter scale. All of this is grist for the socialist writer and historian who is sitting with me now. Once a meat cutter and long haul truck driver, nowadays Mike Davis teaches creative writing at the University of California, Riverside. This recipient of a MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant has written so many books we can barely get them on the screen for you. Two of his histories of Los Angeles and Southern California City of Quartz and Ecology of Fear were bestsellers. His latest is titled In Praise of Barbarians, Essays Against Empire. Mike Davis, welcome to the journal. My pleasure, Bill. Did you ever in your life imagine that America's financial system would become insolvent or that our way of life would be in such a sudden free fall? No, and I found myself in the position of, say, a. Uh, uh, Jehovah's Witness, who of course believes the end is nigh, but then one morning wakes up, looks out the window, and the stars are falling from, from heaven. <laughs> it's actually happened. Uh, of course, people of the left, like myself, uh, are famous for, I, I think the phrase is, we've predicted 11 out of the last three uh, uh, depressions. <laughs> so, but no. I do think this time most everyone would agree with how you've described what we're going through as the mother of all fiscal crises. Do you have a sense of the people you know being frightened right now? Oh, people are terrified, particularly where I teach in, 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 in Riverside County. People have no idea, uh, you know, where to turn. UC Riverside is the largest percentage of working class students in the UC system. Mm -hmm. And their families have scrimped and saved and they've worked hard to get into courses that pointed toward stable careers and jobs and now those futures uh, or incinerated. What kind of choice do you make? You know, what do you study? You wrote uh, an essay on one of my favorite websites, TomDispatch.com, in which you asked this question, can Obama see the Grand Canyon? Now help us understand the use of that metaphor. Well, the first explorers to v visit the Grand Canyon simply were overwhelmed. 
they couldn't visualize the Grand Canyon because they had no concept for it. That is, there was no analog in their cultural experience, no comparable landscape uh, that would allow them to make sense of what they were seeing. It actually took 10 years of heroic scientific effort by John Wesley Powell and his great geologist, Clarence Dutton, before he was truly able to see the Grand Canyon in the sense that we see it now as a, a deep slice in Earth history. Uh, before, you just had confused images and you know, feelings of, of, of vertigo. And so the reason I, I, I raise this is that do we really have an analogy? Do we have the concepts to understand uh, the nature of the current crisis other than to step back shaking from the brink and say this is profound? Because, you know, we're in a situation where not only do we seem to be having a second depression, but this is occurring in the context of epical climate change. It's occurring at a time when the two major benchmarks that survive for global social progress, the United Nations Millennial Goals for Relieving Poverty and, and Child Mortality on one hand, and the uh, Kyoto Goals for Reducing uh, Greenhouse Emissions, both of those sets of goals are clearly not going to be achieved. They, they've clearly failed. This would be a, a, a time of fierce urgency uh, in any sense. And now we we face a meltdown uh, of a world economy in a way that no one anticipated, truly anticipated the possibility of another recession, even a financial crisis. But no one counted uh, on the ability of this to happen in such a synchronized, almost simultaneous uh, way across the world. You wrote in that essay, and we'll link that essay to our own site. We are looking into an unprecedented abyss of economic and social turmoil that confounds our previous perceptions of historical risk. Our vertigo is intensified by our ignorance of the depth of the crisis or any sense of how far we might ultimately fall. That was five or six months ago. Do you have a sense now of how far we might ultimately fall? No, and the, the consensus is that no one does. You can read the financial press, and almost nobody believes uh, that the financial bailout is going to work. So nobody's seen the, the bottom here, and we're working uh, largely on the basis of hope and faith and, and, and crossing our fingers. We've invested in, in, in one person, an almost messi messianic, uh, responsibility. And how's he doing? What's Obama done right so far in your judgment? Well, I think what he's done most right is to push through the stimulus package, which I argue is primarily a relief bill. Because obviously you can't talk about uh, stopping the decline if you're going to allow the public sector, the local public sector, uh, schools and public services on a right. state and local level to collapse as they are. You have to shore that up. Not that the stimulus is, is sufficient to address the totality of the fiscal crisis across uh, the span of local governments, but it puts a band-aid over it. It, it, it. it slows the results of that. Uh, it extends un unemployment. Uh, it pays... Unemployment the, compensation. For unemployment right. compensation. Gives a little more money to people who are out of work. Yeah. Of course, there's a big difference. When my father was on WPA in 1935. Works Progress Administration. I remember it well. Every dollar he was paid by the federal government, 98, 99 cents of it went on products that were made in the United yeah. States or grown in the United States. One of my nephews, who's unemployed today, just lost his job in Seattle. He takes his unemployment uh, money down to Walmart or Sam's Club and probably 40, 45 cents of that money, the stimulus to the Chinese or the Korean economy. So the, the stimulus in this country, Keynesian stimulus, uh, doesn't necessarily have the multiplier effect. That is, it doesn't create as, as much right. jobs or, or, or circulate in the extent that it did before. And this is, of course, the huge difference between the situation today and the 1930s, which is that in the 1930s, the United States had the largest, most productive industrial machine in the world. Uh, it could make almost anything. The question was how to put the workers and the machines back at work. Uh, 
uh, today, you know, so much of our national uh, wealth, so much of our employment, it just depended on services linked right. to the financial role of the U.S. But unlike Roosevelt, who could undertake institutional reforms that would reduce the control of banks over, over industry, now we're part of an integrated interlock system where what we can do on a national scale is ultimately limited by our, our creditors and by the dollar. And internationally, where every part has become so interdependent that it's hard to think about a general recovery without some kind of simultaneous and coordinated effort. And that seems to be uh, you know, utterly utopian at this so moment. In that same essay back in October, you were asked the question, is Obama FDR? Well. Well, I'm prepared to concede that in terms of his, his character, his moral beliefs, his empathy or compassion for Americans, but above all in his understanding of the, the urgency and the unparalleled nature of, of this situation. Yes, I mean, he could be Roosevelt, he could be Lincoln, but I mean, Bill, the, obviously the real heroes of, of the New Deal were the millions of rank and file Americans who sat down in their auto plants or walked on freezing picket lines in front of their factories. They made the New Deal possible. They provided the impetus to turn Washington to the left. We're talking very differently about the legacy of Franklin Delano Roosevelt if it hadn't been for that incredible insurgency of labor and other ordinary Americans in the 1930s. Garment workers, for example, when they left the Socialist Party, so to speak, and went into the Democratic Party, Roosevelt had a real infusion <laughs> of blood. Well, a lot of them joined the American Labor Party in New York because they, they would, could not in good conscience ever pull that lever that said Tammany Hall Democrats. But they wanted to support Roosevelt without supporting the, the Democrats. In the 1930s, of course, you had vigorous third parties, often in power on state levels. Farmer Labor Party, the Commonwealth Federation in Washington, the nonpartisan league, and you the course, Progressive Party out in Wisconsin and uh, in, yes. in the Midwest. Yes, and you had these progressive Republicans, you know, in the tradition of La Follette or before that of William Jennings Bryan, who, if they were seated in the Senate today, would be seated to the left of Bernie Sanders, or the most uh, progressive uh, Democrat. They were the real hammers on the issue of the concentration of economic power. They were the, the ones who were exploring military spending and the scandals of the First World War. They are the ones who led the investigations on who really owned corporate America, on the role of banks and the House of, of, of Morgan. And this was of incalculable importance that they opened the books on the American economy for about the first and only time. And one of the things that hasn't happened yet is to do that right now on, on Wall Street. The most fundamental straightforward questions about who are the counterparties who own the credit default swaps? Uh, yeah, who are the main creditors? Uh, of these banks. In the midst of bailing them out with tens of billions of dollars of tax money, the public doesn't have any idea who's actually benefiting, who the parties are, are involved. What's your explanation for why we don't have that pressing inquiry and that demand for accountability that we had in the 1930s? Well, in the 1930s we had a, a, an interesting coalition between a progressive middle, middle class including at that point still a lot of farmers, uh, a very dynamic labor movement, even though uh, it was divided, and a journalistic culture, literary you know, culture, that was in constant pressure and debate with the left. Uh, the left was all important in the 30s, and I'm talking about not just the Communist Party, but Social Democrats of all kinds, not because they were uh, that significant a force politically, but they were significant intellectually, and they were asking deep and profound questions about the nature of economic power, economic institutions. And in turn, this was leading, if not to sweeping reforms, at least to an exploration for the first time in American history, really looking at, at who holds power, how does economic power influence 
political decisions in, in Washington, all the things that most Democrats and most Republicans uh, are probably most afraid uh, to explore. I mean, why are they afraid? Because they're the beneficiaries uh, of the system. In, in some cases, I think with the president, uh, he's come to accept that there's only really one way he can operate. And that's through, you know, accommodating himself uh, to the forces that exist and, and cutting compromises he sees as inevitable. The fact that they may talk about bank nationalization, but it's nothing more than uh, salvaging the banks for the private sector, rather than talking about the possibility of public ownership. But there have to be times in history when it's the necessary, not the possible, that has to come first in, in, in public, public dialogue. I mean, we've lost so much of the reform conscious, the sense of, of possibility in, in, in this country. We treat political positions as they're in, entirely relative. I mean, we, we let Rush Limbaugh define what a liberal or a socialist is. I believe that liberalism, New Deal liberalism, has a relatively precise uh, historical benchmark definition. And Which that, is? FDR's fourth term election, when he ran on the idea of an economic bill of rights for Americans, something that Lyndon Johnson uh, believed yeah. in and, 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 and tried to renew. And if you advance any agenda right now for how to get us out of this crisis, it would be to renew this concept of a the real social citizenship, an economic bill of rights, and also the enormous need to strengthen the power of labor in the economy. The post-war golden age of the 50s and 60s was a period when unions were powerful enough to be major parts of the, of the macro economy, when wages were tied to, to productivity. And they played a, a, a dynamic, incredibly central role in the American economy, which of course they, they lost in the late 70s and, and, and under uh, Reagan. It was the strengthening of, of labor, that is the, the power of ordinary people in the unions that made the accomplishments of, of, of the New Deal possible. People who almost doubled the size of the American economy during the Second World War. And yet Obama's only been in office two months now and there's this chorus of voices, the, the Wall Street Journal editorial page, conservative talk radio, Fox News, Lou Dobbs, CNBC's Kramer and Kudlow, all blaming Obama for the bad Economy are those attacks sticking out where you live in California? <laughs> well, I mean, what could be more absurd than the, uh, the you know the people who brought this country to its knees uh, now being the chorus of dissenters now representing themselves as the populace? The fact that they're the ones that have erected the the, the antenna, the lightning rod for popular anger, uh, is is worrisome. Because if these bailouts and stimulus fail, if the country sinks uh, deeper into what could be a, a very long period of, of, of stagnation, uh, if popular anger is monopolized by the demagogues on the right, I think you could see a real resurgence of the Republican Party, or at least of its most anti-immigrant economic nationalist wing. This is something may, maybe not very visible on the national screen, but when you live uh, near the border like I do in Southern California, or the southern cities, areas of, of the mid, Midwest, this has really invigorated what you once would have referred to as the John Birch Society wing of the Republican uh, Party. The, the vacuum left by the fall of the Soviet Union has been filled by, you know, good old-fashioned uh, nativism. Uh, uh, immigrant bashing. I think no group uh, is so vulnerable right now uh, is the immigrants whose labor has sustained the California economy for the last generation, legal or unlegal. They have the fewest entitlements, they have the, the least safety net, and their jobs are the ones that are being uh, impacted most directly because they work in construction services or, or uh, industries that are uh, highly sensitive to, to the business cycle. Some have gone back to Mexico. Uh, Mexican statistics show that. But it doesn't make sense for most people uh, to go back. The border economy has really collapsed. Uh, the tourist economy along the border 
is dead. The maquiladoras, the right. border assembly plants, uh, are, are laying off. So having made huge investments to get the United States, it doesn't make a lot of sense to go back to a country where uh, there are even fewer jobs and, and fewer hopes. How are people s surviving? Well, in some cases, they cram five into a room. They're standing in front of Home Depot. is hoping they won't get uh, picked up by the police or the, uh, the immigration service. And, of course, this exists in a situation where it's very likely that uh, our southern border and, and that Mexico are going to become very, very destabilized, further destabilized than they are. And this provides lots of ammunition to construct a whole, like, Versailles myth of uh, the economic crisis, uh, you know, to blame immigrants, to blame liberal, to blame the imaginary socialism of uh, bank rescue plans that are fully endorsed by The Economist or The Financial Times. You know, Mike, there's so much talk from that side of the spectrum, raising the specter of socialism, and I thought I might as well talk to a real socialist about what <laughs> the term means. I mean, I cannot find anyone in this country advocating the abolition of private markets and the wage systems or nationalizing all the major industries. No one's arguing for supplanting capitalism, are they? I am. You are. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I must admit, I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of old school socialist in the way that Billy Graham's an old school Baptist. Uh, I do genuinely uh, believe in the democratic social ownership of the means of production. But that's religion. Okay? That's yeah. the religious principle. Uh, and in the role, practice? Well, I mean, the role of the, of, of the left, or the left that needs to exist in this country, is, is not to come up with utopian <clears throat> blueprints on how we're going to run the, uh, an entirely alternative uh, society, much less to uh, express nostalgia about authoritative bureaucratic societies, uh, uh, you know, like the Soviet Union and, or, or China. It's really to try and articulate the common sense of, of the labor movement and social struggles on the ground. So, for instance, you know, where you have the complete collapse of the financial system and where the remedies proposed uh, are, above all, privilege the, the creditors, the very people responsible for that, it's a straightforward enough proposition to say, hey, you know, if we're going to own the banking system, why not make the decisions and make them in lines with social policy then ensures that housing is affordable, that school loans are affordable, that small business gets credit. You know, why not turn the banking system into a public utility? Now, that doesn't have, have to be in any sense an anti-capitalist demand, but it's a radical demand that asks fundamental question about the institution and who holds economic power. You know, why isn't the federal government not taking a more direct role in decision making? I mean, I believe, for instance, during the savings and loan crisis, there was a period when the... Uh, 1980s, late, yeah. late 80s, right. Yeah. I mean, the Resolution Trust Corporation was set up to, uh, you know, buy up the abandoned apartments and homes and then sold them, uh, the fire sale to, right. to private interest. For a year or two, it had the means of uh, resolving much of the housing crisis, you know, in the United States. Why shouldn't the federal government basically uh, turn that housing stock into a solution for people's housing needs. Sell them directly to homeowners at discount, you know, rent them out. In other words, the role of the left is to ask the, the deeper questions about who has power, how institutions work, and propose alternatives that, that seem more commonsensical in terms of the direct interest of, you know, satisfying human needs and equality in this society. I think President Obama, and uh, the liberal Democrats that, that still exist uh, should actually welcome a revival of the left. It only strengthens them in a way. Uh, it's like being Martin Luther King without having Malcolm X. But the problem with the Democrats is they fold. The Democrats tend to concede to, to, to the Republicans uh, a, a power and to give them uh, a veto or ability to is, is shape legislation that they, they need into. We need something of the spirit of Roosevelt in 1937, 1938, when he tried to take on the right wing of his own party, the Supreme Court, the right wing of the Republican Party.
he was accused of being a socialist. They tried to paint him with that. He was accused of conducting class war, as in fact now Obama's being accused by conservative forces of launching a class war because he wants to return the tax rate to 39.9 percent, which is where it was in the Clinton era. I mean, how do you deal with this charge of class war coming from the Wall Street Journal and the Heritage Foundation and others? Well, I think you deal with it by saying, yeah, we want class war too. And here's what class war means, that the only possibility of getting this country out of the crisis, the only possibility that really deep set uh, reforms can occur, including the protection and, and, and renewal of the productive base of, of the economy, is labor has to become more powerful. We need more protests. We need more noise uh, in, in the street. At the end of the day, political parties and political leaderships tend to legislate what social movements and social forces have already achieved in the factories or the streets or, you know, in the civil, in the civil rights demonstration. And the problem is that so many progressives, so many liberals, uh, now treat the new president as if he were El Comandante. And we line up, follow, you know, follow his leadership. But he's maneuvering in a relationship of forces where people on the left, progressives, even the Black Caucus doesn't count for that that much. He's appeasing blue dogs. He's having to deal with Republicans. And, and to an absolutely unnecessary extent, I think he's following the template of the Clinton years. And, of course, the Clinton years were years of the closest collaboration between financial industry and the, and the White House and the produced financial deregulation. I think the best thing the, the president has done is the stimulus. The worst thing has been to continue the, the bailout along the same lines that it was initiated by Treasury Secretary Paulson, a bailout that's clearly rejected by the majority of the, the American people and, and seen as a reward uh, you know, to the very people who you know, ignited this crisis in the first place. But the deep questions about how do you rebuild a productive economy, the necessary role of the public sector in providing employment, whether fair trade is impossible, to what extent deglobalization, deglobalization, as some people call it. You reversing know. history? Well, it, history, we learned, is, uh, you know, can be uh, reversed. I mean, the saddest thing, and remember with, with my own dad, who was a meat and potatoes, 30s trade unionist, loved, loved Roosevelt, and he's a guy who grew up in the early 20th century believing in American history Every time the American people struggled and, and won a new right, okay, that became then a foundation for the other struggle, and that was irreversible. And he saw in the, you know, in the Reagan years, uh, history going in, in, in reverse. His union pension fund went bankrupt. The particular industry he worked in basically uh, became defunct. And, and it, was, it was harrowing to me to see my father, who was the most patriotic guy I ever, ever knew, as it, it struck him that we're always continually fighting for principles and rights and they can be taken away. History, you know, uh, you know can go in, in reverse. But by the same token, where does it say in the Bible that we should live in a, in, in a globalized uh, uh, economy where uh, the world's, you know, run by, you know, Wall Street or the authoritarian leaders of, of China? I haven't seen that. People with ideas like yours in the last 30 years have been marginalized. No coverage in the press, uh, no participation in the public debates. Why did you become a radical? What made you so radical? <laughs> well, in, in my case, there really was a, a burning uh, a bush, and that was the civil rights movement in San Diego where I grew up in the 50s and 60s. And when I was 16 years old, my father had a heart attack, and I had to leave school for a while to to work, and I have a black side of my family by marriage. They got me to come to a demonstration, Congress of Racial Equality, uh, in front of the Bank of America in downtown San Diego. And uh, I mean, it literally transformed my life, just the sheer beauty of it and the, the sheer righteousness of it. And I won't claim that every decision or political stance or political group I joined is a result of the Civil Rights Movement was the right one but it, it permanently shaped, shaped my life. 
then I think it was a, a friend of yours, this great Texas populist uh, newspaper editor, Archer Fullingham. I was in Texas in 67, and most of my friends were becoming Marxists, and I didn't want to become a Marxist. And I heard him gave a great speech, so I made a pilgrimage. He's sitting on his porch carving a gourd out in Coons, Texas, Hardin County. And uh, I, I said, Archer, can we revive the populist party? You know, can you be the leader of the populist party? And he, he looked at me and he said, son, he said, you're one of the dumbest piss I've ever met. He says, the populist party is history. Corporations run this country and they run the Democratic Party. And you better figure out this stuff for uh, yourself. And it's what I've been trying to do since. I mean, to be a socialist uh, in the United States is not to be an orphan. It's, it's really is to stand in the shadow in a you know immense history of American radicalism and 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 labor, but with the responsibility uh, to ensure its regeneration. And I actually think the American left is about to receive a huge blood transfusion in uh, the next year or two. It it has to because the existence of a left, the existence of radical social economic critiques, the existence of imagination that goes beyond. Uh, selfishness and principles of competition uh, is, is, is necessary to, to, to have any kind of serious debate in, in, in this country. I um, pull something off the web that you wrote recently. You said, I believe great opportunities lie ahead for the rebels of the world to swell our ranks and take the fight forward. A new generation of young people is discovering that their political engagement counts. Now, where are you seeing that? Well, I, I have no difficulty uh, finding hope. Hope kind of seeks me out. I, I've seen things in my life that I, I couldn't really believe to happen. Black working people in the South, anti-war, uh, uh, you know, GIs. And when you've seen that happen in, in, in your life, you can never be pessimistic. But there's an enormous legacy of the American, American left and of American radicalism in general that has to be nurtured and continued and passed down and let new generations shape it in you know, the ways it needs to be shaped. Mike Davis, thank you very much for being with me on The Journal. Thank you.